anyone was ever to hold a competition to find the craziest dictator in the world, who would you vote for? Obviously, the dreaded Kim Jr. in North Korea would be a candidate. Good old Colonel Gaddafi in Libya. But if it was up to me, it wouldn't be a contest. There's only one winner, and that is the man they call Turkmen Bashi, or as he likes to call himself, Turkmen Bashi the Great. Every dictator needs somewhere to dictate, a country, a manor. And Turkmen Bashi's territory is Turkmenistan. Where's Turkmenistan, you'll be thinking? Somewhere dangerous is the answer. Slap in the middle of Borat country. That's Kazakhstan up there. Down here, Afghanistan. Uzbekistan's over here. And this is Iran. So when it comes to location, 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 this place is an estate agent's nightmare. No one's made a film about Turkmenistan before because you're not allowed to. The country belongs to a notorious control freak, President Turkmen Bashi. And he's got it sealed up tighter than a jar of gherkins. Turkmen Bashi means the leader of the Turkmen. And if there's one thing the leader of the Turkmen doesn't like, it's foreign journalists sneaking into his country and filming it without telling him. Which is exactly what our plan is. Okay, I feel like you're a journalist, no? No, 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 but I'm, I'm a teacher of art. Okay. So I'm interested particularly in this, you know, our cover story is that we're a bunch of guys on a stag week. Ridiculous, I know. But you try thinking up a better reason why a film crew-sized gang of blokes would wish to blunder about the drinking dens of Turkmenistan, taking pictures and whispering things into their cameras. Hello, greetings from the British pub in Ashgabat, where, as you can see, there's table football to be played, pool tables, everything a man could need in a British pub, and Guinness as well. The British pub's a surprise, and so is our hotel. It's nice, but the guidebook says it's bugged, so I switch rooms a few times to fool whoever's watching, and I commence my mission, which is to separate the facts about Turkmen Bashi from the fictions. Money here is called a manat. I just can't work out the exchange rate. Basically, you get zillions of these for a quid, and it doesn't go very far. The biggest denomination is 10,000 manats, which I think is worth about 25p. But see here, if you look on the manat, and indeed all the notes have it, there's a portrait of the president. That's Turkmen Bashi, okay? Now look at him there, look at his hair, okay? And look at him here, this is a map I bought. A map of Turkmenistan. See, look at his hair, yeah? That's the president. Now, look at this picture of him that you see all over the city. I mean, this is the image of him that's everywhere. See the difference? 
from which I conclude, given that this note was printed in 2003, I conclude that the president dyes his hair. Turkmenistan has a nasty reputation. I feel pretty brave just coming here. As for filming the place, let's just say I didn't sleep too well last night. The hotels packed us off on a tour of Ashgabat, the gleaming white capital that Turkmen Bashi's been building in the desert. He started with nothing. Now he's got this. It's on the left side, it's under construction. Not finished yet, the cultural center and the new uh, uh, library. It's huge, look at that. It's the Ministry of Oil and Gas. The Ministry of Oil and Gas, shaped like a cigarette lighter. Yes. And this building on the left side, in the form, in the shape of Cobra, the health ministry. It's a cobra. Yeah, it's a bit wrong, no? <laughs> After a couple of streets, it's clear that this is one of the silliest places on earth. How many white elephants can you get into a capital city? This many. The white stuff is marble imported from Italy, mile after mile of it in every direction. Over there, with the huge gold nugget sitting on the roof, is the presidential palace, which no one's allowed to film. That thing there, shaped like Dan Dare's rocket, is the Arch of Neutrality. It's 75 metres tall, and on top, there's a gold statue of Turkmen Bashi in a Superman cloak. The statue is motorised and revolves throughout the day to face the sun. But the weirdest monument in Ashgabat is this giant statue of a book. Not any old book. This is the president's book. He calls it the Ruknama, or Book of the Spirit. <laughs> and inside this grabby cover of lollipop pink and lime green are Turkmen Bashi's collected thoughts. Everything he wants his people to know and understand. You have to answer questions on the Ruknama to pass your driving test in Turkmenistan. The TV's always going on about it. You can even get it in Britain, it seems. His book Ruknama, the first, second volume, The Spiritual Life of All Turkmen People. You see, this map shows where this book was sent. It was sent into the libraries of 162 countries. Uh, so, we can say it was translated into more than 36 foreign languages. So, all these places on the map? Yes. Ma those are places that the, the, book, sent, yes. the book has gone? Mm -hmm. Yes. Just recently, a copy got blasted into space in a Russian satellite. So now, the Martians can read the Ruknama too. I've been shopping. Uh, bought a bottle, special Turkmen Bashi vodka, which, as you can see, I've already sampled a bit from. And all these other goodies on sale in Ashgabat. Look at that. Turkmen Bashi plate. All kinds of pictures with him on. Maps, exercise books. I've got these nice little lapel pins that you stick to your jacket. But the thing I'm most proud of is the book. 
got a copy of the book, the Ruchnama. School kids have to pass O levels on this book. There are even crosswords in the newspapers uh, based entirely on this. It's a very, very special book. To understand this country at all, you have to somehow try and understand this. So I'm going to have to read it all for you. And uh, I mean, it's an unusual cover, I think you'll admit. I've never understood the thinking behind these mad personality cults that dictators adore. What exactly is it they're trying to achieve by plastering their faces over everything? It needs serious investigation. Oh. Oh, that's strong. One circle bashy. There's only one Turkman one Turkman Now don't tell me that that doesn't look a little bit like the young Cassius Clay. Go on, it does, doesn't it? It's him. This is a, just a little exercise book I bought, a school kids book. It's got all these, uh, months of the year and rather notoriously Turkmen Bashi has changed all the months of the year. So January famously has been renamed, it's now called Turkmen Bashi. So my birthday for example will be the 12th of Turkmen Bashi. Um, going down the line a bit, January, March, April. April has been renamed after his mother, that's his mother, so that's Gurba Sultan. Um, and all the way through, so if you look at look, September, September has been renamed Ruhmana after the book. So um, let's say you want to go on holiday, or you come back from holiday on the 4th of September, then what you should be saying is, I'm back on holiday on the 4th of Ruhnama. And once you get the hang of it, it's very easy to learn. And I think what is important is that all the rest of the months have all been named after, you know, poets, famous places in Turkmenistan, some of the buildings that he built. So uh, it's a comprehensive rewriting of the Central Asian calendar. We've decided to fork out 80 pence each on a two hour flight to the Caspian Sea to a place the president has named after himself, Turkmen Bashi. It falls to few men in history to name cities after themselves. And frankly, Turkmen Bashi should have done better than this. Turkmen Bashi, the city, turns out to be a dump. The hotel's fine though, five stars. They all are. Oh, the fitness centre? Yeah. That's a good idea. Unfortunately, the only tourists around here are us. And we're only pretending. But what a magnificent view we have to ourselves of the Caspian Sea. I love the television they've got here. There's basically three state channels. And they're all the ones with a little gold profile of the president in the corner. And one's devoted to business, another one to music. This rather strange one, which is mostly about the president's book. But he's such a character. Uh, there's this wonderful story about him 
uh, on the music channel sacking all the cameramen because they were making the Turpleman women look too fat. Which I can believe camera angles are very important. And then uh, and he sacked the weathermen because the weathermen were always getting the weather wrong. And we all know how frustrating that is. Um, and most recently, there was a thing in the paper about uh, makeup artists making women's faces too white for all the powder they put on to stop them glistening. And uh, the president didn't like that either. Quite rightly, he said, Turkmen women don't need powder on their faces because their natural color is good enough. And I'll drink to that. The lads have decided they want to dip in the Caspian. We get driven out to a beach made largely of broken bits of old building. There used to be a village here, but the president knocked it down. He has big plans for another hotel. I'm too sensible to go in the water, but the sound man, Mike, and the director, James, do a good job of keeping up our cover as a silly bunch of blokes on a stag week. That's, it. Well done. That's the president's summer house over there, the one sticking out into the sea. It must be nice out there. Turkmenbashi Hotel. Shower cap. I'm taking it home as a souvenir. So the hotel is in the city of Turkmenbashi, which is the most important port in Turkmenistan. And it used to be called Krasnovodsk, which is Russian, if my Russian serves me correctly, for red waters. Now I have two reasons for coming here. One is to find out more about Turkmenbashi. Uh, which is my mission here, as you know. But the other one is to try and get some caviar, which, of course, Turkmenistan is famous for, as are all the Caspian states. Now, look what I managed to get in the market this morning. It's the best beluga in Turkmenistan. And this little lot cost me about... 25 pounds. It's a lot of money, right? But I reckon in Selfridges in London it would have cost me about seven or eight hundred pounds. So uh, it is of course absolutely illegal to take any of this home or export it um, and I'm not uh, I'm not the kind of guy that breaks the law so um, of course while I'm here um, I'm going to eat all this. I wouldn't dream of trying to uh, take it back into England. That would be, that would be undemocratic. It would be wrong. It's good to be back in Ashgabat. I'm getting to like the place. I like all the stands. They're the final frontier of global wackiness, the places that normality forgot. No McDonald's, no Tom Cruise, no Jade Goody. Ah, heaven. One reason why Ashgabat is so clean is because the president has banned dogs. I'm entirely with him on that. Cinemas are banned too, so are circuses car radios and ballet. The president's decided that none of them are Turkmen enough and all of them are unnecessary. Instead, he's opened a museum devoted to the Turkmen carpet. This whopper here is the largest carpet in the world. And Turkmenistan people say, put your carpet, I will read your soul like a book. Mm -hmm. If you, when I read your carpet, I read your soul. Yes. Put your carpet, yeah. I read your soul. 
There's also a giant puppet theatre made out of mountains of white marble. To me, the puppets look out of their depth on this grand marble stage. But I'm not a Turkman. And look here, it's a theme park in the middle of Ashgabad. Its theme is the Turkman fairy tale. It's due to open next year. The locals have already dubbed it Disneyland in the desert, which is some people's image of the whole country. One of the stories about Turkmen Bashi that I heard before I came here was that, uh, and it really tickled my fancy, I have to say, is that uh, he banned makeup. He told Turkmen women they cannot use makeup. Why? Because Turkmen women are so beautiful, they don't need makeup. The women aren't you know, covered up. I mean, this is uh, a Muslim society, but no one's wearing burqas and hiding their faces. Um, they seem very free and buoyant, and I mean, they work bloody hard, harder than the men by the look of them, but um, nevertheless, you know, they're not overtly, visibly repressed. Now, I wonder why, and of course, the answer, as all the answers are, is in here, in the, uh, the great man's book, the Ruknama. Listen to this, the quote, Turkmen's faces reflect the light of Allah. For that reason, sunlight, which is the torchlight of God, should fall on their faces. This should not be prevented. So that's why you see all these beautiful Turkmen women going around in their loose flowing robes, showing their faces so that the light of Allah can fall on them. To find out what makes Turkmen Bashi tick and where he gets the money for all that marble he's been importing from Italy, we get ourselves some wheels and hit the desert. We're heading for the dead center of Turkmenistan. And since the desert takes up 95% of this country, we're heading for the center of everything. The guy driving claims there are eight different types of desert in Turkmenistan, but it all looks the same to me. It's a very long drive, which gives me plenty of time to attack the Ruknama. Okay. Yeah, it smells uh, right. gas. Okay. Yes, okay. Which way is the wind? It's going that the way. Is, uh, this way. So this is a good place here. Good place, and uh, please don't go uh, close than three meters, okay? Okay. It's dangerous. Let's do it. So this is where the president gets his money. Natural gas, propane, oozing out of the sand in infernal quantities. 
40 years ago, the Russians set fire to it by accident. Now, no one knows how to put it out. If you've ever wondered where hell is, stop wondering now, because I've found it. And if you can imagine, you can see, uh, I'm gonna stay on this side, and you can take a picture from here, and you can see how it's big. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, okay. yeah. What, on the other side? Yeah. yeah. Okay. <laughs> the Russians were here for a hundred years, lording it over the Turkmen first as Tsarists, then as Communists. They finally left in 1991, when the old Soviet Union fell to bits and Turkmenistan suddenly found itself independent. The trouble was, it had never been a country before and didn't know how it was done. Someone needed to invent the new nation. And guess who stepped forward? Yes! I like your job more and more. <laughs> You're tall, you can take it. Guralu Chechinezo. I'm not really completely pissed, and singing Polish songs in the Turkmen desert while wearing a Reading shirt, that's just my cunning cover. Fantastic! My big friend. You know what? Bravo! Having plied our drivers with drink and sneakily softened them up, what do they really think of their president? The answer surprises me. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> when, when, you, when you're drinking uh, this uh, vodka, it's, uh, it's not simple. It's not simple because the president is a good man. No. Yeah. Yeah. Good. That's why the, uh, his portrait here. That's why it's good vodka. Good vodka. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Absolutely. We like our president. Why not? Yeah, why because not? because uh, gas, mm -hmm. electricity, water are free. The salt almost free. Mm -hmm. yeah. The gasoline, you see, you see that uh, yeah. almost free. Two cents per liter. Mm -hmm. It's nothing. Yeah. Yeah. Did you yeah. see uh, ever uh, <laughs> cheaper uh, yeah. gasoline? Yeah. <laughs> but it's nice to see that people really think... love him now. People love him here. Of course. You know, why, not? They... What? why not? Nice. Yeah. 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 I was 11 years old before they are independent. You know? mm. I don't know exactly <clears throat> the situation. You know. <clears throat> then, <clears throat> since 1991, everyone happy, you know. He was uh, building the new factories, you know, new factories, new uh, ministries, new... Uh, everyone happy. It's, it makes uh, the people uh, so uh, freely, you know, I mean... Positive. Positive, yeah. It's a very positive country, definitely. Yeah. Yeah. So, gas is free, water is free, electricity is free, petrol costs two cents a litre, and everybody loves the president. Is that what he really thinks? Or is he playing to the camera? I wish I knew. It was a great time. I can't sleep. Tossing and turning and thinking about all the things I've seen. It's so confusing. There's this thing in the book, in his book. You love these little stories, these little stories that somehow illuminate what he's thinking about. And there's this thing in the book. It says a bunch of a bunch of blind men go to feel an elephant to try and understand it. And half of the blind men feel the trunk and they think an elephant is soft and droopy. But the other half of the blind men go and feel its leg and they think the elephant is hard and tough and like a column. And uh, Turkmen Bashi says that people's perceptions of Turkmenistan are like that. 
different. He's right, you know. He's right. On the drive back to Ashgabat, I see the desert in a new light, as a huge book without any punctuation. When a place consists of this much nothingness, creating a country out of it is a hell of a challenge. Where indeed do you start? We pull up at a typical yurt for a typical lunch. What's typically on the menu? Camel's milk. Mmm, delicious. Good camel. That one. Yeah. This lady's this lady's yurt. Yes. Mostly the people here are shepherds. One family probably has. Uh, around uh, 400, 500 sheep. Yeah. And some camels also, 15, 20 camels. This is what Turkmenistan should be, and always has been until now. A slab of desert sprinkled lightly with nomadic yurt dwellers, horse rustlers, and carpet makers. It takes a particularly powerful imagination to envisage a country made out of these unlikely raw materials. And it takes a real tough guy to push the plan through and grab the ungrabbable. Back in Ashgabat, I decide to find out more about Turkmen Bashi. Not about this extra large Turkmen Bashi made of gold who sticks himself on the tops of buildings. He's just acting tough. I'm after the inner man, the hidden Turkmen Bashi, the lonely orphan whose story I've been reading in the Ruknama. Family. This is your president? Yes, father, mother, and two brothers. Oh, it's really? Outside our president, child for time. This is that one. Yes. So the it's right. On the right, the president yes. on the right, huh? Yes. Yes, so that the one. the president when he was a young man. His real name is Sapur Murat Niyazov, born just outside Ashgabat in 1940. When he was two, the Germans killed his father. His mother and the rest of his family perished soon after in an earthquake that measured 10 on the Richter scale. 170,000 people died. Ashgabat was destroyed. This is Turkmenbashi's monument to the earthquake. The big bull is nature getting angry. The little boy is him. The communists took in the lonely orphan and became his family. Little Saparmarot Niyazov was good at being a communist. And in 1985, Gorbachev made him first secretary of Turkmenistan. Niyazov liked the job so much, he decided to keep it forever. <laughs> After independence, he made himself president and started calling himself Turkmenbashi, the leader of the Turkmen. 
A few years later, his title got upgraded to Bayik Turkmen Bashi, Turkmen Bashi the Great. So it's a Harry Potterish tale of an orphan and his destiny. Where I come from, Potter is a work of fiction. Here, he gets to be president. And he fills the country with statues of the dad he never knew, and of his mum, and his brothers. As a stand-in for the hometown he lost, he builds himself a white marble city, a mirage in the desert. And in that city, he gets to waste as much bath water as he wants. Whoopee! Just when I had Turkmen Bashi in my grasp, we get booted out of Ashgabat. The tour operators have insisted that we visit Turkmenistan's most popular tourist destination. Indeed, its only tourist destination. The famous ancient city of Merv. Merv used to be a crucial hub on the Silk Route, but these days it's a long way from anywhere and on the road to nowhere. So on the left side and uh, on in front of us, you can see the last uh, fortresses. Centuries. Six, seven centuries. Brilliant. Certainly big. When we finally get there, it's obvious that that ruthless vandal, history, has beaten us to it. Merv looks as if it's been flattened by a herd of stampeding elephants. There's almost nothing left from the days when much of the known world was ruled from here. So many ancient civilizations here in Merv just left bits of them behind. Everybody came through here. The Archimedes, the Seleucids, Alexander the Great, Abdullah Kala Khan. All of them left behind these palaces and broken fortresses. And I don't know if there isn't a lesson there for certain somebody I know about the transience of great empires. To me, there's something to be learned from a place like this by someone I know very well now. We're spending the night in a town called Mary. Nice name, horrible place. Even the indefatigable Turkmen Bashi seems to have given up on Mary. The hotel looks fine, but isn't. I have a terrible night and keep thinking about the damned Rugnama. I managed to finish the book, so I could now pass the Turkmenistan driving test. I'm sure one of the few people who could. And, you know, I learned things from it. It's certainly not a good book, but it does have a resonance. Is if you're a Turkman, of course you're gonna go for all that stuff. It's all about how great the Turkmans are and how they've got to build this nation and how the nation needs to have spiritual underpinning. So as he says in the book, you know, um, a country needs national ideals just as a train needs a railway track. A 
At the back of the bus, I'm not happy with myself. I'm getting to understand Turkmenbashi's mission, maybe even to admire it. And that can't be right. Amnesty International's been keeping an eye on this place and doesn't like what it sees. Dissidents keep disappearing. Foreign newspapers are banned. The internet doesn't work. Not much gets into here and nothing gets out. The trouble is, no one's actually given us any problems. You can get the BBC News on the hotel telly, and if the Turkmen are being mightily oppressed, they're certainly good at hiding it. The best photo of the president is this one, right? It's absolutely everywhere. When you come in on the aeroplane, Air Turkmenistan, he's there staring at you. He's on all the fronts of the buildings like this. He's uh, absolutely painted on the sides of lorries and posters, absolutely everywhere, this particular image of the president, right? The most interesting thing about this image is this big smile on his face. He's very keen to project an image of a smiling, benign leader. And the key to it, I think, is this passage in the Rukmana. There's a whole chapter about how important it is to smile. I think it says here, let me see what I've worked for in your smiling faces, and he goes on. The smile is a sign of love. Smiling faces bear a sacred light in them. Allah says, those smiling, high-spirited people are closer to me. I will grant them twice as much as I will grant to others. The smile is the reflection of the human soul. And so it goes on, on and on and on and on. There will never be any wrinkles on a smiling face. Oh, that's obviously why he likes this particular image of himself so much. And he's not wrong. He's certainly not wrong. It is nice to smile. Last year, Turkmenistan banned child labour. A few years before that, the death penalty was abolished. The gargantuan arch of neutrality might look wickedly ostentatious, but it wasn't actually erected to commemorate Turkmenbashi's resemblance to Superman. It was erected to celebrate the national decision taken in 1995 never to go to war and never to join with anyone else who goes to war. Just outside Ashgabat in the hills, the president's built this enormous walkway, endless set of stairs. And the idea is that every now and then people go on this health walk, as it's called. And today is a special health day. So there's hundreds of keen students and politicians trudging up and down. Something I like is that the president always makes sure that his cabinet go up here at least twice a year as well. And these middle-aged men trudge up here. They've got to do it in 90 minutes, the whole eight kilometers. And the president himself, of course, he just goes to the top and arrives there by helicopter, which is putting people in their place, isn't it? But uh, what an excellent way to spend a Saturday morning going up eight kilometers of stairs. Certainly makes me feel healthier. Why, uh, why today so busy? Because uh, today is a day of uh, health. Oh. That's why every instant. 
to the area. Uh, everyone comes uh, here. How do you find this road? So far, not so difficult. Yes. But we just started. But there. a lot of way. Long way to go here. Yeah. See you at the top. Yes. <laughs> Good morning. Good morning. <laughs> Okay, Swana. Good morning, ladies. Good morning, madame. Спасибо. Спасибо. Cup of tea. So what have I learned? Was I expecting a brutal regime that oppressed its people, crushed their spirit and cut them off from the rest of the world? Yes, I was. But have I found it? No, not at all. Instead, I found this incredibly jolly and peaceful and eccentric and very, very interesting place. And, of course, the president's crazy schemes aren't at all realistic. I hate to think how much it must have cost to carve this walk of health right through the mountains of Ashgabat. But is spending all that money on this really worse than spending the money on Trident or spending it on sending all those troops to Iraq? I don't think so. And I think Turkmenistan has got a bad press, a press it really doesn't deserve. Am I being terribly naive? Are awful things happening behind the scenes? Maybe. But I've been to some heavy places and this isn't one of them. I've looked hard and all I can see out there is a happy dictator playing with his train set. Whoopee! Whoopee! Whoopee!